This is Brent of the Brookbush Institute, and in this video, we're going to go over a joint based manual therapy technique. If you're watching this video, I'm assuming you're watching it for educational purposes and that you are a licensed professional with joint based techniques within your scope. That means osteopaths, chiropractors, physical therapists, you're probably all in the clear, physical therapy assistants, athletic trainers, massage therapists. You need to check with your governing body in your state or region to see whether this is within your scope of practice. Personal trainers, this is definitely not within your scope of practice. Of course, all professions could use this video for purely educational purposes to help with learning biomechanics, anatomy, and of course, palpation. In this video, we're gonna go over posterior to anterior mobilizations for the cervical spine. Now that's unilateral posterior to anterior mobilizations, which I think you guys will find is the workhorse of all of the mobilization techniques we use for the entire spine. I'm gonna have my friend Melissa come out. She's gonna help me demonstrate these techniques. The first thing I'm gonna talk about is set up a little bit. We're gonna have Melissa face down in the uh, face cutout here. And just so that we save her, her more sensitive cheekbones, remember we're gonna be pressing down on her neck, which means we're gonna be pressing her down into the table a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and have her use a towel so that her forehead takes most of the force. We're not gonna be pressing that hard, but this area tends to get easily aggravated, especially if we have multiple segments or multiple facet joints we have to mobilize. Now, the next thing is we want the arms in a comfortable, relaxed position. That could be by their sides, that could be hanging off the table, or if you're lucky enough to be here at Flex in New York where I treat, like we have the arm cutouts that depress so you can see Melissa can just kind of like hang out in this position, which tends to be very comfortable for cervical patients. The, what, the thing you're trying to avoid is we don't want increased tension here, right? The muscles that go from the scapula to the cervical spine, namely the levator scapula and upper trap. Last, you guys will notice that the, the table is pretty low. And the reason the table is low is I want to be able to get my chest over Melissa's neck and then put my arms straight and have my thumbs right where they need to be. Because once we start doing the MOB, all I want to be, have to do is rock my torso. I don't want to be in a position where I have to either use my hands or my elbows, right? My like extension using my triceps. Because number one, if I have a lot of very large patients, I'm going to wear myself out really quick. And even if I don't have a lot of large patients, I think you guys will find that this is just not a consistent amount of force. It's hard to be really, really consistent when you're doing this or you're doing this compared to, okay, I get here and now I just rock. It's really easy to keep a very consistent amount of force this way. Next thing we need to consider is anatomy, guys. And if you haven't spent some time going over cervical spine anatomy, I suggest doing a little review before you start practicing this techniques. And I do suggest you purchase or find one of these to practice on. Um, I know they're a little expensive for what they are. I think they run between 80 and 150 bucks, right? I bought one of the flexible ones. And let me explain why. I know this and this aren't exactly the same, but this is a close facsimile to the bones and joints of the cervical spine. And there's something to being able to touch, feel all the different bumps, Challenge yourself to go, okay, I'm going to find the transverse process of C1, all right? And then be able to look down and go, oh, I'm on the transverse process of C1. Or go, I'm going to find spinous process of C3. All right, I did it. I did it. I remembered that C1 doesn't really have a spinous process. Okay, so as I'm doing this, what I'm doing is building a visual model up here of what the bones of the neck look like. And I can't tell you how helpful that is when you get your hands here, which is basically that with a bunch of mush on top of it. It's not exactly the same. I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but I think it's going to help you guys as a learning tool that once you get your hands in here and you can get through the soft tissue, you get better at feeling through the soft tissue, you'll start being able to match up your visual model with what's actually going on here a lot quicker. Now we are gonna start with the most complicated joints of the neck to actually palpate and mobilize, but that's just because we're gonna start from the top and work our way down. So let me show you guys how to palpate C1 and then how we're gonna mobilize C1, CO or the at low occipital joint. 
So if you guys feel the back of the skull and then take the back of the skull towards the ears and find that little point known as the mastoid process, right? That's like right here, guys. And some of you guys have felt your mastoid processes before. They can be a little tender to poke on. And you guys go, what does that have to do with the cervical spine? Well, if you go just inferior to your mastoid process, you can actually feel it on yourself. Like you run into like two hard things sticking out this way. That's actually the transverse process of C1, right? So find that on your patient and then look down and I want you to draw an imaginary line between your two fingers. Right? A little horizontal line between your two fingers and think C1's right under that. All right, so I know C1 is right under that line. And then if you can remember that the atlo-occipital joint tilts towards the person's eyes, you can think, okay, if that's C1, I need to go just above C1 so that I can get on that AO joint and I need to push in this direction. So what I'm going to have you guys do is trade your index fingers, which you were probably palpating the transverse process with, with your pinkies. Lay your fingers over right where you think C1 is and then think, okay, which side am I going to do? I want you to put your thumbs where these two fingers were. So if I had just laid down my fingers like this over C1, I'm now going to put my thumbs right over where my middle and fourth finger were on one side and then I'm going to try to push up towards the eyeball and I think you guys will find that as you gently push in and kind of give a couple test presses, you'll feel that joint move a little bit. Now I actually find this position a little uncomfortable for me so I tend to put my thumb down on this side if I'm going to mobilize this joint and then I use this arm over that thumb. Once again, I have kind of big hands, right? So for me to do thumb, thumb next to thumb is really tough. And then I'm just going to mobilize in the direction of her eye here, just like so. All right, so that's how I find that, that occipital at, atlas joint, right? That AO joint or COC1 joint. Now, notice guys, I went thumb over thumb. All of the techniques for the cervical spine are either thumb next to thumb or thumb over thumb. And be careful. Don't let yourself get into extension too much in your thumbs. I, that can ruin careers if you keep doing it. You end up with hypermobility there and then it becomes really hard to do these techniques. And try to use both hands whenever possible so that you gain the benefit of the strength of both of your thumbs rather than wearing down one. Like I'm sure I could get in here and I have enough hand strength to do it just like this but that's going to wear me down over time. This is a much safer technique for my hands. So we have COC1, let's go C2, C3. If I look for the spinous process that's just underneath Melissa's skull, that spinous process is C2. So C1 doesn't have a spinous process. If I then drop slightly lateral and inferior, I end up on the facet joint of C2, C3. Now, you'd think, well, that's easy enough. And then I can just press down. And I know some of you guys have already figured out that I skipped C1, C2. And there's this little trick, right? So if I find the spinous process and drop off, that's C2, C3, and I can do my normal PA is C2, C3, and I can either do it this way getting over the top, or I can do it this way, getting over the top. Right, and again, I'm, I'm thumb over thumb because my thumbs are fairly large. If you feel more comfortable this way, that's fine. I'm going to find my first resistance barrier and then push through to the end, find the end point. You guys are going to find that there's not a lot of range of motion there. Right, back off to 50% and then I can do either my grade threes or my grade fours. For C1, 2, you got to remember what joint that is, right? So that's the atlo-axial joint, right? The AA joint. That joint wants to rotate. And if you just press down on C1, C2, right? Like I'm pressing down on C2 here, there's too much left because of rotation for that mobilization to be effective. So what we need to do is get to end range of motion and then start mobilizing. And the way we do that 
is just turn Melissa's head about 30 degrees. So she's just going to kind of lay on one side like she'd lay on a pillow. And I'm going to go back to that same facet, that same bump, because I was basically over the top of C2. All right, so just right here, and then I'm going to push straight down. And then, of course, retest rotation. All right, guys. So quick recap here. And once again, these are the hardest joints in the cervical spine to figure out. So if you can get these, you're in good shape for C1 and the occiput. You're going to go towards her eyeball just underneath the occiput. Right? So you can go over the top this way or you can come around to the side and then I end up using this arm because this arm's now facing her eyeball. This is my dummy thumb. I can go this way. If I then find the spinous process of C2 and drop off laterally, you end up naturally wanting to drop off laterally and inferiorly a little bit. That bump was over the top of the articular pillar of C2. If I press straight down, that's actually mobilizing C2, C3, which is fine if that's what you want to mobilize. If you were looking for upper cervical rotation though, and you think that C1, C2 is stuck, then you're going to need to rotate towards and press down. Because right? I needed to take up that end range rotation, like basically turn C1 all the way like this, and then press down on C2 to get more range. Guys, that was the hard part. That was the hard part. If you got that, rewind this video, watch that a couple times. If you got that, the rest is easy breezy. So, C3. Now we're starting to get into mid cervical spine, fall off just lateral and inferior. I like to come around side, the side, it's just straight down. And then C4 is just one segment down again. C5, one segment down again. C6, one segment down again. Now you guys know C7 is spinous prominence, so that's, that's right here for her. All right. And I can go right there. So I can mobilize all of those joints. There's nothing special about them. It's just, you just kind of go lateral and you end up dropping off just a little tiny bit. And I can go straight through all of these. Now let's, let's talk a little bit about what I'm feeling for as I'm doing these mobilizations. I already mentioned it a little bit. Don't forget your protocols. So every time I get over the top of a joint, before I mobilize, I'm going, okay, there's my first resistance barrier. There's the end of articular arthrokinematic motion before I would just start pushing her into further extension. All right, so my end range of this motion. All right, so first resistance barrier, end. And usually if I'm going to do this, guys, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go, Rrr, end. I'm going I'm to kind of do some test pulses my way down until I get to the end, see if the patient, depending on how sensitive they are, can take it. I'm going to back off to 50%. And now I have my choice, right? I can either do larger amplitude grade threes going from first resistance barrier down to 50% or maybe just a little beyond 50%. Or I can do my grade fours, which are a little bit more intense because I'm going to start at 50% and do small amplitude or go even deeper as I need to. All right? So get here, one to two oscillations per second. And I'm going to keep going probably for 30 seconds or more until I feel a change in tissue sensitivity. Or not tissue sensitivity, I guess is the wrong word, maybe uh, malleability, tissue density. I'll feel like it's easier to move the joint. How does that feel, Melissa? Feels good? Now we do have to be very careful. With the cervical spine, we are as likely to end up with a hypermobile segment as we are to end up with a hypomobile segment. And I think we get into the unfortunate habit of going diagnosis, modality, right? That's how we treat, right? We cervical pain, mobilizations is what fixes it. And we have to keep in mind that that's not very good logic. Mobilizations are to increase mobility. And if somebody has pain because they're hypermobile, then we could be making the problem worse. 
And the unfortunate thing is a hypermobile person sometimes feels very tight because they end up with a lot of spasming and increase in tonicity in those extensor muscles. So it is very important that as you're doing these mobilizations, unless you've been with this patient for a long time and tried this before, I would do one facet joint, have them sit up and redo my tests, right? See if that reduced their pain, increased their range of motion. If it increased their pain, I'm heading in the wrong direction. It could mean that I chose the wrong facet, that I mobilized the hypermobile facet rather than a hypomobile facet. It could also mean that mobilizations maybe aren't the most appropriate thing to start with and maybe we should back off and start thinking about maybe this person needs more of like exercise first, stability exercises first, or maybe I need to leave the neck alone and maybe treat out, treat out the upper thoracic spine and I see if I can get some, some good progress that way let their neck calm down before I come back to these more aggressive techniques that directly affect where they're having pain. All right guys, so just to review here real quick, CO, C1, 2 is just off that first spinous process, or C2, C3 is just off that first spinous process you feel. If I rotate 30 degrees, C1, C2, all of the other cervical facets feel like little bumps you're going to get it right over the, the, what is called the articular pillar. And when you look at the spine, the cervical spine, all they're talking about with the articular pillar is the facet joints stack up in such a way that they feel like pillars on either side of the spinous process. So for the rest of the cervical spine joints, you're just getting right lateral and slightly inferior and pressing down. And we're probably mobilizing the upper on the lower segment. And you guys can just think about that as you go through and feel each one of these bumps, right? That's, that's connected to the spinous process as you try to loosen up all of those cervical facets. Guys, stay tuned for your close-up recap. Now for the close-up recap, all of the palpations and the various ways to do these UPA mobilizations for the cervical spine, which is a little complicated. We're going to go ahead and start from the top and work our way down again. I mean, you're going to find the mastoid process, which is this little bump I think you guys can see sticking out right here, right behind Melissa's earlobe. And then if you go just below that, on either side of her spine, you'll feel these two things sticking out like so. Right, and those are her transverse process. And then if I put my pinkies on those transverse process and just lay my fingers down horizontally, just underneath her occiput, my fingers are right over C1. Now, if I wanna do this side over here and I just replace my third and fourth finger with my thumbs, I'll be over that COC1 joint and then I can push down, find my first resistance barrier, right? Remember that I'm pushing down towards her eyeball. So this one's not straight on. This isn't not a straight on PA this way. It's this way a little bit. So I have to kind of push back in towards her head and I'll find my first resistance barrier, my end range, back off to 50%. And then do either my grade threes or my grade fours. Now. The next one we're going to find is actually C2, C3. <coughs> and if I drop off laterally and inferiorly from C2 spinous process, remember the C2 spinous process is the first spinous process we feel underneath the occiput because C1 essentially doesn't have a spinous process. So if I go right over C2, C3, I can go ahead and do my normal straight up and down PA over that little bump I feel essentially between C2 and C3 spinous processes, just lateral to it. All right, so that bump, again, where's my first resistance barrier, where's my end, back off to half. Now just like in the video, you guys will notice I went CO, C1, C2, C3, because to get to C1, C2, I need to turn Melissa towards me, or towards the side that I'm mobilizing, because I need to take up all that slack in the atlantoaxial joint which wants to rotate. So if we're going to improve range of motion, we need to get pretty close to end range. But then once I get her in this position, 
I'm just going to go back to C2 spinous process, fall off, and do a PA. Same thing. All right, so it's not a more complicated technique. You just have to remember the little trick of taking up all of the upper cervical rotation you can. And then for the rest of the spinous process, it's just fall off a little lateral, a little medial, onto what feels like an articula a pillar, right, a column, or articular pillar. You can feel those little bumps, right, that little bump this way. And there's even a little bumpiness this way at each facet joint. You can just do your PAs, right? Go to the next spinous process, do your PA. Next one, as long as it feels stiff, you can keep going. Or you can do one and then retest. Or you could do one and then do the other side if you think it's more of like a, a bilateral restriction. These PAs will work all the way into the upper thoracic spine for sure, even coming over the top of somebody as I am here. You could be on the side of somebody. If you think something is unilateral, do all one side and then retest. So the rest of these segments are real easy. Just fall off this way. Find your first resistance barrier, your end resistance barrier, back off to 50%, of course 0 to 50 for a grade 3, or stay closer to 50, be a little bit more intense, and this would be our grade 4 mobilizations. As per all our techniques, assess, address, and reassess. I hope this helped make sense of these palpations for you. So there you have it. Assess, address, reassess. Make sure that every time you choose a joint-based manual therapy technique, it is based on an assessment and that you return to that assessment after you finish the intervention to see if it was effective for the individual, the patient or client that you have in front of you. Ensure that you continue to learn your anatomy because your anatomy is going to help you with your hand placement, with understanding what a joint can do, with understanding what you may gain from this particular technique. And of course, practice. You have to practice these techniques, hopefully not for the first time on a patient or client who just walked in the door. If you can, find a more senior instructor or a mentor to give you some really good hands-on instruction. Use your peers for some good feedback. And of course, always look for live education to help with your manual therapy techniques. I know these videos make education very convenient, but there is no substitute for learning manual therapy in a live setting. I look forward to talking to you guys again soon.